I'm here again with David Pakman, who is a partner with Venrock, one of the most successful venture capital firms on the street. And David, cannot thank you enough. In terms of the technology landscape today, it is constantly evolving. It's constantly changing in all ways, shapes, and forms. What what are you seeing out there, um, and what do you, how do you sort of view the future? One area that's a fun one to talk about in New York is media and digital media, since this is the media capital of the world. To me, media has been undergoing a dramatic transformation since the invention of the commercial internet. You know, music was the first industry to really be disrupted, um, but traditional print media, magazines, newspapers, decimated, right? You know, significantly changed industry. We think TV is next, right? It's about to undergo some real dramatic change and probably movies after that. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the form of distribution, but the entire value chain, who gets compensated for what, um, how a product reaches a consumer. You know, we have uh, sites like Kickstarter and Indiegogo in the world that sort of reverse the process of crowdfunding innovation in, in media. But also now, I think the biggest change is because everyone is connected to the internet, we're all participants in media. We're not just the consumers anymore. We're actually participants. We're creators or curators also. In the old, old way media worked is someone shouted at you from broadcast model and you just sort of received it and had nothing to say back to it. That's totally changed. And most of the orientation of the traditional media companies is that they know best, right? right. That they make the programming, they send it out and pack up and go home after that. But that's not the way media works anymore. Media works by curating what everyone else has to say. And uh, that's a pretty dramatic change. I think that's really disruptive. And David, what are some of the other companies out there that are interesting? What about Bitcoin? There's never been um, a mechanism for doing a, a non-centrally managed transaction. We need uh, an innovation to have a distributed mechanism for a transaction to happen. And that's what the innovation uh, underneath Bitcoin creates. It's called blockchain. Mm -hmm. And it's a public ledger that is open for everyone to see uh, that self-validates to allow one person to transfer some intellectual property to another. Now, the first use of blockchain is Bitcoin, which is a, an alternate form of currency. It's a cryptocurrency without a central bank operating it. There's a bunch of people who have arguments for and against why the currency itself may work or may not work as a store of value. But the real significant innovation around it is the blockchain, a public ledger. Uh, and a distributed public ledger without a central authority. That could significantly revolutionize property transfer everywhere. The settling of a stock transaction, uh, the signing of a contract, uh, the selling of a domain name, the selling of a house, the movement of currency. So this is a super exciting area that is unbelievably early. I mean, we're in, you know, the first batter of the first inning in this area. We're exceptionally excited by it and are looking for other innovations on top of blockchain, not just Bitcoin. Interesting. So you're saying that uh, companies making money off the float? Making money off the float, okay. making money off the fact that they're the only trusted authority in town. I mean, if you want to buy an SSL certificate today to protect your website, there's only one guy you can buy that from. Right. Uh, so there's just no reason for that. I mean, ACH transfer taking a couple days, um, uh, international money wires, um, you know, SWIFT. There, th these are outdated technologies that have um, allowed for incumbents to generate a huge amount of fees that are, are inefficient. I mean, it shouldn't cost 2.75% to swipe a credit card. It actually doesn't cost 2.75%. Someone charges you 2.75%, but the costs associated with that are, are much lower than that. So I think we have uh, an opportunity with blockchain to, to really uh, disrupt the notion of a centralized middleman um, arbitrating the movement of intellectual property, and that could be significant. There are big markets around that. Interesting. And are there any competitors to Bitcoin today? There are a bunch of different cryptocurrencies, about 10 other ones that are, that are known. There's many more than that beyond. Um, Bitcoin has by far the most amount of liquidity in its ecosystem compared to even the number two or three, four. So I, I think it's unlike, and these, these systems have network effects in them. So, you know, it's, it's a marketplace. There's buyers and sellers and there's liquidity and there's incentive to mine and, and disco discover more coins. So I don't think that someone's going to overtake Bitcoin in the cryptocurrency race, but I do think we can see distributed file sharing. We can see different mechanisms for distributed compute and tallying up the way computing is, is rewarded or paid for. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned, you know, property transfer, contracts, intellectual property rights disputes. Uh, I'd really like to see a bunch of the traditional sectors be disrupted over this. 
Sure. Well, I think they're going to be, no yeah. question about it. What about a company like Apple, who's you know been around forever and they just came out with a new iPhone? Uh, where do you see those guys going down the road? The open question that still is in some people's mind is, as the products that came to fruition under Steve Jobs run their natural course, you know, what are the new innovations that the new team can bring to market and will they be substantial enough? There's still an extraordinary product people that work at Apple and I don't think they've all lost it suddenly when Steve left, but you know, can, can uh, one of the things Apple was best at was saying no, deciding what not to do. Um, you know, looking at the iPad and iPhone lineup today, you know, the number of devices they make now is you know, 10x what they made, uh, you know, even five years ago. And Steve was very simple, I and mean, well, he liked very simple, uh, very few choices for customers. And so I, I kind of feel like looking at the product lineup and seeing how many SKUs they have now, this is not something that would have happened under Steve. I don't know if it's going to be bad or good, but it's certainly different. And it just calls into a little bit of question what the long-term strategy will be. Sure. Any other hot areas that you can think of? Well, security is super interesting, right? Uh, you know, we've got now essentially institutionalized, federalized, uh, state-sponsored hacking um, in both Russia and China. We have like almost legalized criminal enterprises in Russia and China that are attacking American and global companies tens of thousands of times a day. And the stakes are enormous. And we're actually losing the war against hackers. If you look at the number of successful attempts uh, on, a, on a sort of daily, weekly, or monthly basis over the years, uh, and the number that we discover, there's a gap in those that we're, we're losing. So there, this is a growth industry. How does one protect or minimize the effects of institutionalized, criminalized hacking? Um, we're invested in a number of security companies. I think it's a real challenge and a really exciting market. Do they ever catch these guys? You never hear about that. They sort of end up knowing who a lot of the people are, but you know, Interpol doesn't take our search warrants and go into Moscow and arrest these guys or go into Beijing and do that either. So, no, a lot of the people aren't arrested if they're U.S. based um, and, 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 and in some other European countries. Every now and again you hear about it, but largely no, these people are going un, unarrested. And so the penalties aren't severe enough because no one's getting caught. Got ya. If you were looking for somebody to come work here, an analyst or an associate, um, what is it that you and all your partners are looking for? Well, I think first of all, we're hopeful to find people with networks, right? I mean, the the name of this game is is finding great deals, which are great entrepreneurs going after really large markets and, and having a passion to disrupt them. And finding those people is a function of your network. So it's important for us to find hyper-connected young people with great networks. Um, just coming out of college or, uh, you know, that more people are more likely to start um, startups now coming out of college. So it, this is an important market for us. Um, so I think well-connected young people, people with an actual technology background, you know, one of the things that we notice is that they're, everyone knows something about technology now because we're all users, but actually being able being to be a creator of technology, we think requires an understanding of it. So we still prefer people who are engineers, you know, people with software or hardware backgrounds, um, I think have a great advantage in both um, finding companies and also helping evaluate the strength of the technology evolution. Okay, uh, last question, you're at uh, UPenn, and you're giving the graduating class remarks, what would you tell young people today? Well, you can go back and watch that. So that's at YouTube. I, I was lucky enough to, uh, to give the graduation speech to Penn Engineering. And what I said then was, um, and this was largely to a bunch of engineers, that, that engineering is the lingua franca of the future. Like this is, engineering is the new liberal arts degree. Everyone should get an engineering degree because technology, every company needs to be a technology company now and you need to learn the language of technology and the only way to really learn that is to actually try to build stuff with it. So I said to everyone, get an engineering degree. Again, I'm here with David Packman, who's a partner with Venrock. Uh, David, really, really appreciate you taking the time. You've had an incredible career. You've done all sorts of really cool things and I wish you continued success. Thank you, honor to be here, thanks. Yeah.